Welcome to JLive. I'm Laura Mandel, JArts Executive Director, and it's great to be with you for JLive, our JArts virtual event series where we bring you bite-sized conversations about Jewish life and art with the best artists with Boston connections. Today, I'm with artist Allison Judd. Hi, Allison. Hi, everyone. Um, it's so lovely to be with you in your studio. I wish I were there with you. But uh, before we start, I just want to remind everyone that if you have any questions, you are welcome to put them in the chat and we will answer as many of them as time allows. Um, also, a special note, the music you just heard um, during the intro was special because it is actually by Mangina, the Brandeis Acapella group, which Allison used to sing with. So we had a special extra treat there. So, Allison. I love that I get to see your studio today. And while I'm sorry I can't be there, um, it's, it's just really inspiring to see what you have going on there. So I want to start by getting to know who you are a little bit as an artist through a series you've been working on for a while called The Memory of Leaves. Um, so we'll so show some images and start telling us about that series. Yeah, well, thank you, Laura and Jay Arts, for the opportunity to share my space and share my work with people. This is a really exciting opportunity for me. Um, the Memory of Leaves is probably my most recent series of work that I'm almost kind of completed, although I still feel like I'm working on it, and it's something that I come back to a lot. Uh, the Memory of Leaves started about five years ago. I had three kids, and I was kind of getting back into the mode of calling myself an artist after taking some time off. And I've always been inspired by plants and nature. And uh, I kind of set up this plant in my studio as an opportunity to get in the studio and work. I promptly killed the plant because I can't keep plants alive in a basement studio. But I was inspired by the leaf form that emerged out of that. And I started to create drawings from it and stencils. And through that process began making prints and paintings and drawings that really uh, dove into this kind of idea of using this stencil over and over again and layering on top of it, much like I think about my own memories and experience and revisiting moments in time and seeing how they shifted and changed. So the memory of leaves is really kind of a personal narrative uh, series, which talks a lot about my own experience, revisiting moments, revisiting memories, and then using the same form over and over again with the materiality of the paint or the ink for printmaking and building up kind of this surface using thin layers, one on top of the other. And I just have to say, I love seeing the image of you working on these in process with the stencils, because I think when you look at the final product, it, you can't really tell how it came to be. I think that's the beauty of it. Like a memory, it's sort of hazy in a funny way. Um, but I love if everybody can see the stencil there. Tell us a little bit about how you actually create these pieces. Great. So as you can see in the image, I tend to work flat. So I started doing these as a series of prints uh, using the print shop at Mass Art, where I went to my master's degree. Uh, and I still take continuing ed classes before COVID so I could get into the shop and use their print making tools. And using that process of printing flat and kind of layering on a flat surface, I really wanted to transfer that to my own studio practice. So I discovered pretty quickly that really working flat was important. And then cutting out these stencils, I have them in lots of different sizes and I have little tiny ones and I have really big ones and I lay them down on the painting. And there's an element of the kind of absence and uh, revealing that happens through this process because I'm covering up elements of the painting and then I need to kind of reveal it after it's done. And there's always this aha moment of like, I'm not exactly sure what's going to be when I lift up the stencil, but then it's really kind of a, an exciting moment for me to see that, you know, when the stencil comes off, the way the paint and the marks interact are kind of a surprise and unexpected. And there's something that I love about that when I'm making my work. It's beautiful. It's like the reality of leaves moving in the wind. It's like memory. It's really beautiful. So something I find fascinating is when you and I first met, you were sort of a Jewish person and an artist. But you even said to me, I think at one point, you hadn't really intersected those identities as much as you might like. And I think, um, I think, you know, through getting to know each other and your work with J Arts, especially, you really started to sort of see the the blending there, which I think is so beautiful. Um, so even though these leaves don't necessarily read as Jewish, can you talk to us a little bit about what you see as the Jewish story in these pieces? 
Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I am, I've always, you know, I am Jewish and that's who I am. And I'm also an artist and a mother. But for me right now, the Jewish piece was something that over the years I've, you know, incorporated my Jewish in different bodies of work that I've done. So when I was in grad school, I was doing a whole body of work on ritual and nida and being a woman in the Jewish community. And, you know, as as I've continued to work, the memory of Leaves is not necessarily about being Jewish, but it's my own personal narrative. So it's really about my journey through being a Jewish woman and a Jewish mother and how those experiences kind of come to be. And lately I've been thinking a lot about uh, generational trauma in the Jewish experience and how, you know, just experiences, I'm the grandchild of um, Holocaust survivors on one side and on the other side, I'm not, but they also had experiences and, you know, what it was like for my grandparents, you know, coming to a new country where they had to flee and, and feeling really rooted in who I am and where I am. And, you know, the experience of being, I think a Jewish person is, a, has a lot of that in it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think you also are so fluent and, and learned within Jewish um, text and tradition that you're able to infuse it in ways that, or speak to ways it's infused that in some ways we may not even understand. So I really appreciate that. Right, I think on that note, it's, you know, I, I think a lot about that as well about, you know, I've always learned, you know, in Jewish day schools, I grew up going to a Jewish day school and learning text over and over again, I think is really something that I carry in my everyday where revisiting moments, revisiting text, revisiting memories, every time you see it's slightly different. And really the memory of leaves is a lot about that of like each time you come and approach something, it's not gonna be the same. So whether that's a memory, whether that's a text, whether that's an experience you've had in the past, or even being in the moment right now, you know, it's always going to be slightly different. So I think a lot about those when I'm making the work as well. So I find it totally fascinating that everything you're talking about is so beautifully abstract. And yet you told me we have something in common that you actually went to school originally to Brandeis um, to be an architecture major, which feels so linear and not abstract. So um, tell us a little bit about how you turn to this form of printmaking and art making from being an architect initially. Well, I grew up and I, I grew up in New York City and I was exposed to amazing art from a very young age and architecture. And I fell in love with, you know, projects and home projects at a young age and just kind of thought that architecture would be a really nice, uh, you know, career to pursue. I, I always did art for fun and I really liked math and I thought it would be like a natural tie-in. Uh, when I went to Brandeis, they don't actually have an architecture program. So I was forced to kind of pick a major that was going to support, you know, further studies. And I was taking art classes for fun and then realized very quickly that in college I can take art and actually major in it. And that was a revelation moment for me where I was like, oh, I can actually do what I love. And that's what I did. So I remember I did a summer course in architecture at Harvard while I was in college and I had to go and get more supplies to draw straight lines. And all I wanted was paint and colorful paint. And I missed the smell and I missed the color. And I think that was a moment where I said to myself, maybe I'm not actually meant to be an architect. Maybe I actually am meant to be a painter. Amazing. Well, and then of course, you already mentioned that you went to mass art. So tell us how that led you to mass art. Yeah, I had a great experience at Brandeis. They have an amazing art program there. I'm still in touch with a lot of the faculty members I had there and they're still super supportive. Um, when I finished Brandeis, I had just gotten married and we were rooted in Boston and I knew we were gonna stay in Boston. And I wasn't sure exactly what my next, you know, career was going to be. I, I thought I was going to be an artist. So I stayed on Brandeis as a post back program. And I stayed there for a year. And from there, they encouraged me to apply to my MFA program. And I applied to MassArt. I applied to BU, again, knowing I was rooted here. And MassArt was the school that worked for me. I had taken some classes there over summers and fell in love with their print shop. They have like the most amazing print shop on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And if you've never been, it's definitely worth a trip post COVID to check it out. And I just had a great experience there. It, you know, at first when I got there, I had been in pretty much Jewish school my whole life, Jewish day school, and then Brandeis, which is essentially a Jewish school, is a Jewish school, but, you know, the community was 
very rooted in Jewish tradition and Jewish holidays. And I remember when I started at Mass Art in September, explaining to my teachers that I had to miss school for Yom Kippur, which I assumed that we'd they would know about, but they didn't. So then when I had to explain that I was missing school for Simchat Torah or Shemini Atzeret, it was even more complicated. And that was kind of the first time that my bubble burst where I realized, you know, there's a lot beyond this world. So Mass Art was a great experience for me. I really got a lot of exposure to different types of art making at Mass Art. It wasn't just painting and printmaking. There were photographers in the program and there were interrelated media artists in the program. So I was really exposed to lots of different ways of making art. And I think that really set me forth um, in my art career. When I finished Mass Art, I ended up getting pregnant immediately. That was something that I knew I wanted to start a family and I was waiting until school ended so I could get pregnant. And I ended up taking some time off raising my three kids and yeah. That was kind of how we ended up with Mass Art and, you know. Beautiful. So that was the perfect segue because I actually wanted to note to everybody out there that um, I loved hearing your experience throughout COVID of being part of this artist mother group. Um, and you exposed me to this. Um, and it sounds like you've really had an enriching experience through being part of this group. So tell us a little bit about this artist mother group and what that's been like throughout COVID for you. Yeah, well, I think a lot of people, you know, when COVID hit, and I think a lot of people can relate to this, um, we kind of went into survival mode and kids were home. I was barely able to get into the studio, which is in my home even. And it was just a very hard time for me. I didn't really have a community. I didn't really have an opportunity to share my work. I didn't really know how to get out in the art world or in general. And the Artist Mother podcast is a podcast that I started listening to and they have amazing opportunities. And it was kind of this aha moment of, wait, there's other artists, mothers out there who are doing the same thing I'm doing. And every episode I listened to, I was thinking, wow, they sound just like me. And I can relate to that. So they offered a crit group where I met with uh, a bunch of different women across the country who I haven't really met in person. One of them I was able to meet in my studio this summer, which was an amazing opportunity. And otherwise, they're all around the country and we've connected through Instagram and messages and supported one another kind of during COVID. And it's been a really nice opportunity to get to know other artists and others that I would probably have never met. That's, if it that's weren't for really pretty amazing. Talk about it. One of the silver linings of the pandemic. Right. So coming out of this, I know it also inspired you to do a project with 100 drawings. And I know drawing was not necessarily your first natural instinct. So tell us a little bit about this project and what it did for you. Yeah, I've been considering myself a painter and a printmaker. And I always do drawings on the side. But I wouldn't say I'm a draftsman. I, I don't really draw representationally. Um, I've never really drawn my kids either. And I you know, I, one of the things that the artist mother group suggested was setting up a hundred day project. So in March of last year, I felt like now's the time and I, I've never really journaled either or sketchbooked and I wanted to kind of combine all those things. So I started writing down every day, seven things I did, seven things I saw, one thing I heard and a quick doodle. And those quick doodles actually turned into daily drawings of moments that my kids were doing because during COVID, my kids were home all the time. And when they were home, they were just, you know, being themselves. They're kind of in their tween years and discovering who they are. And I wanted to kind of capture those moments. So I started just doing a daily drawing of them. And it ended up lasting more than a hundred days. I still do it every day. And it's kind of my own kind of at the end of the day, I kind of look at it as my, like, as a friend of mine said, a ta-da list, not a to-do list, but it's what have I done today? And so over the summer, I signed up for a virtual drawing workshop as well called 100 Drawings Under Pressure. So it was making 100 drawings in four days. And I thought there would be an interesting uh, juxtaposition between spending 100 days making little drawings and making 100 drawings in four days. And I invited my mother to join me and my brother-in-law and my nephew also. And we all did this virtual workshop together. And I made 100 drawings based on some of those daily doodles. And that's kind of what I'm up to in my work right now. And it's really exciting to see all of a sudden these figures 
that I know and love in these spaces that I have been living in uh, coming to life in my art. Well, I talk about the family that makes art together stays together, right? <laughs> Literally. Um, I know we have a little video of almost like a flip book of some of these illustrations that I would love for everyone to see just because I am so taken by the level of detail and thoughtfulness in each of these. So um, we will show this video. Those are great. Yeah, so just those like everyday moments of, you know, my kids walking down the path or, you know, and as we start to, you know, go out in the world more, it was interesting to see this kind of shift from being inside all the time to actually, oh, now we're outside, we're in a space, we're with other family members. Uh, so that was really kind of a cool process. And I also think you have a future in book illustration. <laughs> They're really great. And also I will note they're directly behind you for anyone who can see on the wall back there. Really, really beautiful. And I know we have a couple other images from this time as well. So we'll put those up and you can talk us through those also. Yes, all right, so tell us about this. Yeah, so these were some of the final uh, drawings that I did in that 100 day project. And as you can see, they really, um, they really moved from those linear, drawings of you know figures to these again kind of visiting that theme of absence and presence and how much do we really need to have and how much is revealed to us how much can we put in our you know put together without having all the information in front of us so abstracting the image down I only worked from those doodles so I haven't actually looked back at the photos that I take of my kids and you know, I try to use memories of those spaces or of what I think my kids are wearing or of colors. And because it was a hundred drawings, I was, you know, collaging things. I was, you know, just kind of rushing to get the drawings done. And, you know, interesting things happen when you work that way. So it was really a really interesting process and an interesting project. And it's interesting to see how they've transformed from these black and white drawings to these kind of worlds of color in a different way than I work in my previous series. It's really beautiful and it's and it is no wonder to me the way you think in color and sort of architecturally and that in addition to being an artist you're actually a curator um, and in a number of capacities uh, everyone should know a few years ago you started a gallery at a pop up gallery called gallery tempo you are leading the charge with us at J arts in Mayim Chaim and the gallery at Mayim Chaim. tell tell us a little bit about um, curation what draws you to that and maybe even why you started gallery tempo. Yeah, I mean, I've always been interested in uh, sharing work. I think, you know, artists need to get their work out in the world and people are making their work for lots of different reasons, but I love putting together puzzles. I think I've always loved doing puzzles and I think I view curation as kind of that, you know, thinking about which art would look good with other art pieces is something that I've always loved. So the opportunity to share other work and put together shows and, decide, oh my God, like this person's work next to that person's work really sing beautifully together. Um, I was a singer. So, you know, finding things in harmony is really exciting to me. And I think that applies to the visuals as well. So I think that was, you know, why I wanted to start curating. And then the gallery tempo was really this idea of bringing art to the people and not just expecting people to go to where the galleries are, that maybe there are opportunities to share artwork in neighborhoods that don't have galleries through pop-up venues. And that was kind of the idea behind Gallery Tempo. And you know, with COVID, it's been a little bit hard to do that physically, but I think there are opportunities now in a way that there weren't before COVID to share work in a virtual way. Yeah. And I think it's so interesting. I was such a fan when you started Gallery Tempo because, you know, I kind of lovingly joke that in Boston, there are very few choices between having your artwork in J.P. Licks or the Museum of Fine Arts. Right. So for me to think about the fact that you've made this space for artists who are more emergent to have a space to show their work is really something very special. So um, kudos to you for making that happen. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we are just about out of time because I promise us 20 minutes. Um, but I just have to note so that everybody knows 
you know, Purim is a very special holiday to you. And we've had a lot of conversations about creative Mishloch, Manot baskets and the like. So I just tell us a little bit about how you have over the years expressed your creativity through in Jewish means, whether it be Mishloch Manot or this parocha you told me you made. Um, tell us, give us an example of when you feel like you've really put your creativity into something personally Jewish and important like that. Well, I think you raise a good point that, um, you know, when my kids were little, I wasn't in the studio making series of paintings and I was always looking for creative outlets. So when my second was born, I really wanted to learn to sew. I felt like sewing would be an opportunity to use color and materials that weren't toxic. And a friend of mine uh, mentioned that Washington Square Minion, the minion that we go to in Brookline, needed a parochet for a new arm that they were building. So we kind of jumped at the chance to do it. And that was a really exciting moment for me because I had never really quilted or sewn before that. Mm -hmm. And I viewed it as a painting. So, you know, I kind of approached making it as a painting with a new material that I hadn't done. And I had, I think I was pregnant when we started it and I had a newborn when we finished it. And it was kind of this beautiful moment of also being able to make art even when I was pregnant. Um, and they still use it today. So it's always fun for me to see it when it's um, in the arm that they're using. And then I think, you know, for Purim, that's another kind of, moment where I look for creative outlets, especially in moments in my everyday. So, you know, kids' birthdays I've always done. You no, know, I used to do, not anymore, but I used to do really fun parties because it was an opportunity to share my creative energy. And I think Purim also was, most recently, my son's bar mitzvah pivoted to Purim over COVID. And we went with a costume theme and we made everyone in the family dress up as the Simpsons and we created a whole little gift bag that we gave out to local people that kind of related. Um, and in the past, I've also done lots of themed Mishalach Manu with my sister and her husband. And so I think creative outlets that tie into my everyday are really exciting for me. I love it. I just had to share that because I am such a fan. Um, all right, we are up at time, but I also just want to note that um, you have been so generous today. If anybody is interested in any of Allison's work um, that's available in her online shop, there's a discount code today just for all of you JLive viewers, 20% off. We'll have the code and the link in the chat. So please go ahead and take a look at her beautiful work. Um, and this has been a treat and a delight. And next time we'll do it from the studio together. <laughs> I would love that. And thank um, you again for letting me share my work. And thank you everyone for joining. Yeah, thank you so much, Allison. And of course, as you all know, JLive is made possible by generous community support from people like you. So if you're inspired by what you've heard or seen, please consider making a gift to J Arts now. And um, thank you again, Allison. Shabbat shalom. We'll see you soon. Thanks. Shabbat shalom.